Thank you all for being here. Thank you, uh, Professor Dershowitz, for being here. I'm going to ask a couple of questions and, and get some of the conversation going. Uh, um, Professor Dershowitz uh, has a plane to Israel uh, later today. He has a brand new book coming out. Um, so you who got one today and could purchase one, you could purchase the new book. Its title is Defending Israel. His lifelong um, relationship. relationship with his most challenging client. So I think it's uh, apropos because the first question that I have of, uh, of uh, Alan, and that is, Alan, why? Where does it come from in you, your past, you, your story, that you have put your profession, your life, on this journey? Well, I was very lucky um, to have been uh, brought up uh, at a time when uh, Zionism was uh, a very popular. And I'm going to tell you that story in a minute. But first, I just want to thank you for inviting me. And I want to just mention a few good friends who are here today. My former student, uh, Josh Gottheimer, who represents you in Congress, who I'm so proud of, having been my student. Bob and Helen Levine, who uh, devote their life to the United, uh, to the J Jewish National Fund. Uh, my cousin Judy Reiner, who's here, whose late husband, Rabbi Jack Reiner, was such a, an important figure in, in Jewish life. Uh, some of my former students, including Ed Nelson. Uh, so it's so it's such a privilege for me to be in this in this wonderful place. I grew up in Brooklyn in uh, right after the war. I was born in 1938, and uh, when I grew up, uh, everybody was a, a Zionist. Uh, we all hoped for Israel. Every house had a, a Pishka, a JNF box. In fact, I now have a collection of JNF boxes from the very beginning. And if you look at like 25 JNF boxes from the beginning, you see the establishment of the State of Israel. The earliest JNF boxes show a couple of little Jewish areas that have been purchased mostly from Syrian landowners. Uh, and then you see a few more, and then a few more, and finally you get to 1948, and you see Eretz Israel, And so it was the most natural thing for me. Uh, I went to yeshiva. I grew up in a modern, orthodox, Zionist home. My family belonged to the Mizrahi movement. Um, and we loved uh, the Jewish National Fund. I was a disappointment to my family, though, because I was a terrible yeshiva student. I was so bad that when Rabbi Zuroff, the principal of my high school, my very orthodox high school, called me in for the graduation speech, he said, Dershowitz, you know, you got a good mouth on you, but a Yiddish cup you do not have. <clears throat> so we got to figure out something where you use your mouth a lot, but not your head. He said, I have two suggestions. One, you could be a lawyer. Or two, you could be a conservative rabbi. He couldn't even pronounce the word reform. For him, that was the worst insult. I wasn't smart enough to be a rabbi, so I had to become a lawyer. And all of my life, I have defended underdogs. My father taught me that. It was a very important part of my upbringing. And so maybe for the first 20 years of my adult life, Israel wasn't an underdog. And I was defending African-American people, people on death row. I marched in the civil rights movement. I defended First Amendment. And then when suddenly the hard left turned against Israel with Noam Chomsky and Reverend Berrigan and you name it, Israel became the underdog. And I now devote more than 50% of my professional life to defending Israel, to defending supporters of Israel, to speaking on college campuses about Israel. I have spoken on more than 100 college campuses and let me tell you why, tell you a story. I get a call. A couple of years ago, we need you to speak at Columbia and make the case for Israel, the liberal case for Israel. I said it would be my honor, of course. I didn't get into Columbia, so I'd love to be invited to <laughs> speak there. I went to Brooklyn College. I said, but I have a question. Uh, why are you asking a Harvard professor to come to speak at Columbia? Wouldn't it be more impactful to get a Columbia professor? And they said, yes, it would be. We cannot find a single Columbia University professor who was prepared to make the case for Israel. Not a single one. I have heard that at Berkeley. I have heard that at Yale. Now it's even true at Harvard because Ruth Weiss and I are no longer teaching 
at Harvard, it's very hard. You get a lot of professors who are prepared to make the case in shul or at a JNF meeting or in private, but you ask them to speak out at the university in favor of Israel, even if it's in favor of the two-state solution, the end of the occupation, the, the liberal case for Israel, they won't do it. Why? Because they're terrified that it will hurt their careers, and it will hurt their careers. I was kept out of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The American Academy of Arts and Sciences is an organization that specializes in inviting people who are not only academics, but who have written popular books and contributed to generally public intellectual life. I was excluded from that organization because of my support for Israel. Now, it didn't matter to me, but if you're a young assistant professor trying to get tenure, and you speak out for Israel, your chances of getting tenure are substantially reduced. Your student evaluations go down. When I started speaking out for Israel, I think Ed can tell you, I was one of the most popular teachers at Harvard, always had the highest ratings. When I started to teach, to talk about Israel outside of the classroom, I never talked about it in the classroom, suddenly about 20% of the students decided to give me zero ratings. Even, for example, ratings on knowledge of criminal law. I would get a zero because they were determined to try to punish me academically for my support for Israel. It didn't matter to me because I was a tenured senior full professor, but it sure matters to young people. And so making the case for Israel today on a university campus has become harder than ever. There are pro-Israel professors on every campus, but they don't have the courage of their convictions. I have to tell you, teaching 50 years, Harvard, Stanford, NYU, um, I have never met a less courageous group of people in general than university tenured professors. It is a terrible thing. Tenure doesn't work. It's supposed to substitute for courage. If you have tenure, you don't need courage. But these are professors with tenure who will not risk their popularity to make the case for Israel. So in your, your, your thoughts, why is Israel such an important narrative for the Jewish community here in America. And I'm going to double it with a question. You talk about professors. On your first answer to your second, why is it important for students to stand up? Students are the ones who are standing up. They're the heroes. I had a student at Harvard who decided he was going to take a course by a professor. You remember his name was Duncan Kennedy. He's a professor of contracts, a hard, the hard left person. Doesn't know very much about the Middle East, but if you're a hard left professor, You've got to teach a course on Israel, and it has to be anti-Israel. So he did it. And my friend Joel, my research assistant, registered for the class. He looked at all the syllabus, and he said, this is not a fair class. It's all anti-Israel. I think you should put a couple of articles in that are more objective and neutral. The professor said, it's my class. I'll decide what's in the curriculum. The student says, no, it's not. With the internet, you don't control the minds of students. And so he put an alternate syllabus, the student did, for every anti-Israel article that the teacher assigned, he assigned a neutral, not a pro-Israel article, a neutral down the middle article. By the end of the semester, more students were reading Joel's syllabus than the professor's syllabus because they saw one was objective and the other was biased. And you know, people say on college campuses, well, we're pro-Palestinian. No, they're not. They're anti-Israel. If they were human rights activists, they would be out there campaigning for the Kurds. They would be out there complaining about what's going on in Syria. They don't care about the Palestinians. The only people who care about the Palestinians are Israelis <laughs> and Palestinians. But you talk at human rights organizations, all they care about is being anti-Israel. That is a fact. And if you look at who else they support, the same people who want to boycott Israel want to do more business with Iran, more business with Cuba, more business with China, more business with Putin, more business with Assad. So this is not human rights. This is human wrongs. It targets one group of people, the nation state of the Jewish people, which is why those of us who support Israel have to increase our support we have to give more to the Jewish National Fund. We have to give them the ability to fight hate with love, to show, instead of just arguing against BDS, to show what the JNF can do in Israel. 
that it can build shelters, that it can help kids who are subjected to rocket attacks of the kind that we're seeing in Israel today. In fact, the headline we heard today was understated. Three people have now been killed in Israel as the result of rocket attacks, and there may be more because this is a concerted effort. And the shelters that JNF helped to build, helping kids play soccer while they're under attack, Kids can have parties now. They can go to bar mitzvahs. Um, I, when I was in Israel, Bob Levine told me to go to a particular place in the south, which is a kind of recreation center for kids under attack. It was amazing. It was miraculous. These are kids who have been brought up with PTS, with post-traumatic stress, and the JNF gives them the ability to lead normal lives. So the more Israel is attacked, the more we have to fight back. You know. People say, I hear this all the time, oh, Jews have too much influence, too much power. Jews control the media, right, the New York Times. We control the New York Times. <laughs> Tell me about that. The only good thing that came out of the New York Times horrible cartoon last week is it put the lie to Jews control the media. <laughs> yeah, if this is what we control, we're really a So uh, uh, Jews have too much power, too much influence. We contribute too much money to Congress. No, we have too little power. We're not influential enough. They complain APAC is the second most powerful lobby in Washington. It shouldn't be the second most powerful. It should be the most powerful. JNF should be the most influential organization. And if you want a biblical source for it, just remember what the psalmist said. Hashem ozli amo yutain. God will give the Jewish people oz strength. Hashem yivarech atamo b'shalom. Only then will the Jewish people have peace. The clear evidence is that the only road to peace in the Middle East is increased Jewish power, Jewish military power through the Israeli Air Force and Army, Jewish political power in the United States, Jewish financial power, Jewish academic power. When Jews have power, there's peace. When Jews are powerless, there's the Shoah. As Benjamin Netanyahu put it very, very well, if our enemies lay down their arms, there'd be peace. If we da lay down our arms, there'd be genocide. That's the clear reality. So don't ever, ever be ashamed of using Jewish power and influence in the interest of peace. So I'm going to go on the cartoon of the New York Times. Thank you. There was a cartoon depicting you as well right. a couple of years ago, and they uh, classified that that cartoon, this cartoon, it's not anti-Semitic, it's anti-Israel. Right. That's the new, the new trope is that you can say anything you want about Jews as long as you put the word Zionist and Israel in there. It reminds me of Stokely Carmichael, who did this 25 years ago. He said, the Zionists in Harlem are selling us rotten meat. The Zionists are selling us rotten meat. Or recently, Jewish, uh, the, the, the Students for Justice in Palestine complained that the Zionist president of Hunter College, who happened to be a Jewish woman, the Zionist president is raising our tuition. And so as long as you can use the word Zionist, you can say anything you want about Jews. Take the cartoon of me. I spoke at Berkeley after having to bring a lawsuit, to threaten a lawsuit in order to be able to speak at Berkeley. They allowed me to speak, and it was a good talk, and a lot of people came, and it was very successful. And then the Berkeley Daily Newspaper, the official newspaper of the city of Berkeley, published a cartoon of me in the shape of a spider. It could have come right out of Dishnerma with multiple arms and legs stomping on innocent Palestinian children and causing their blood to spurt all over. And would you believe it? The Jewish forward, the Jewish forward defended that cartoon and said there was nothing anti-Semitic about it because it's true. Israeli soldiers do kill Palestinians, and therefore it's okay to use a Der Sturma type cartoon. The one this week, I had a article, I've had three articles about it because, you know, I was a regular writer for the New York Times. I've written over 100 articles for the New York Times. I was their go-to guy uh, for op-eds on the law and for uh, News of the Week in Review, for book reviews, and it pained me so deeply to see a newspaper that I was so closely associated with do a cartoon portraying Benjamin Netanyahu as a dog. Can you imagine if they portrayed a Muslim leader as a dog or a leader of any other group as a dog, a dog leading a blind uh, President Trump wearing a kippah uh, uh, the same way. It was, it was based on a cartoon from Nazi Germany in 1940 which showed Winston Churchill being pulled into war 
by a Jew with a long nose and uh, you name it. So, you know, we pay a heavy price for standing by principles, but we have to stand by our principles. So, you write books, you write articles, you speak. Give us a recipe towards success, of fighting BDS, of, of standing up. What do you tell everybody, not just what is the problems, what is our recipe to move forward? So there are a lot of responses. First, there are two BDS movements. Let's be very clear about that. You know, first, I don't like to call it a movement because movements are universal. BDS is just directed against the nation state of the Jewish people. It's not directed against real human rights offenders. But BDS on campus fails and succeeds at the same time. It fails, no university will accept BDS. No university will survive if it decides to boycott Israel. Look what happened even at NYU where they gave an award to Students for Justice for Palestine. Immediately, the president rejected it, and the president of the university said, we are unalterably opposed to BDS. We will fight it at every turn. So we're winning that battle. That's not what the BDS people are trying to do, actually get BDS. What they're trying to do is propagandize the future leaders of America, teach these students that Israel is the worst human rights offender, so when they become the young members of Congress, when they become the young aspirants for president, they will have been propagandized. And so we have to go on campus affirmatively and aggressively and make the case for Israel. We have to make the case that appeals to liberals, to conservatives, that makes the case across the board. We have to make the case that appeals to women, that appeals to gays, that appeals to African Americans, that appeals to Latino Americans. We have to broaden the case for Israel and make sure that people understand not only you can be a liberal and a progressive and support Israel, but if you are a liberal and progressive, you should support Israel. The progressive movement has hijacked the case against Israel. You're on your way to Israel. I'm right. going to ask you a final question so that uh, you can catch your plane. Right. <laughs> You're on your way to Israel for your hundredth millionth time. Hundredth, hundredth about, yeah. You've, uh, you were there with your grandson, I know, right. this summer. You have done... You go through this life and you go through the battles. Tell us, Alan, why Israel is so important to you, to us, to us as a Jewish people around the world. There can be no more important manifestation of modern Judaism than, than Israel. Look, Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people. It's the aspiration that we sought for so many years. I'm going to tell you a very interesting little story. So it's a show us story. So um, a cousin of uh, ours uh, who made it out of the Holocaust moved to Israel and then learned that her sister, who had disguised herself as a Christian, changed her name from, um, um, from um, um, I forget what her Hebrew name was, to Mary, from Miriam to Mary, pretended to be a Christian. She was blonde, she was blue-eyed, living in Poland. And she went to work in a munitions factory next to a Belgian prisoner of war. The munitions factory was attacked by the RAF, and everybody in it was presumably killed. And so my cousin got a message that her sister had been killed. They sat Shiva. They named children after her. She was dead, as far as everybody was concerned. And then my cousin passed away. About two months ago, my cousin's uh, children in Israel get a message saying, do you know a woman named Mary so-and-so? The name wasn't familiar. The last name was a Belgian name. She's becoming demented. She's 97 years old. And she's speaking in a strange language. And we called some people in. And apparently it's Yiddish that she's talking. How would a Christian woman named Mary know Yiddish? So my cousin sent their son, who is a violist, to um, Belgium. And he played old Yiddish songs on the viola, and the woman started singing along. And then on her own, she just sang Hatikva, but not the version that we sang. She sang Hatikva, the original version, La Shuv La Eretz Avotenu, La Shuv, to return to the land of our fathers instead of Liot Am Khafshi. And it became clear this was the woman. She had survived. Her husband never knew she was Jewish. Her children never knew she was Jewish. She's now hopefully going to be able to come to Israel. Her daughters, who are Christian, have now become Jewish because they said that their mother was Jewish and they wanted to honor her memory. What an amazing story. But Israel is at the center of it. 
I support completely what your previous speaker said. If there had been an Israel, if there had been an Israeli Air Force, I have a picture in my office of the Israeli Air Force flying over Auschwitz because it's to remind me what could have been. If Israel had existed, the United States would have opened its doors to so many of my relatives and your relatives who were trapped in Europe. Israel is the key to the preservation of Jewish civilization, Jewish culture in the 21st century. And it's so important. One of your speakers talked about pessimism and optimism. You know, in Israel, very interesting definition. They say a pessimist is someone who says, oi, gewalt, things are so bad they can't possibly get any worse. And an optimist says, yes, they can. Uh, <laughs> so I am both a pessimist and an optimist. I have to tell you that as a Jew, you can never be a permanent optimist. If you look at Jewish history, tragedies have almost always followed great times. Look at Nazi Germany. The Weimar Republic was a haven for Jews. The, the, um, what happened in many parts of Europe with the Enlightenment, a perfect time for Jews. Even in some of the Arab countries, it was a golden age and almost always followed. That's my alarm telling me if I don't leave in a minute, I'm going to miss the plane. Uh, so um, I want to end by, by talking about how I am an optimist. We have never been stronger as a Jewish community. Israel has never been stronger militarily, but it faces existential threats. So there's no better time because we are the wealthiest Galut community ever to exist in the history of the world, and you owe Israel a debt. You are more secure because of Israel, and you have to dig deeply into your pockets. I'm here today as a speaker. I don't live in this community. I made a contribution. I'm going to continue to make contributions to the Jewish National Fund as long as I'm able to. And I urge you, please, to contribute as much as you can. There's no more important act that you can make to support the Jewish people, the survival of the Jewish people, may door to door from generation to generation, than showing your material support for the nation state of the Jewish people. Give to the Jewish National Fund. Thank you so much. Alan, I want to thank you from all of us at Jewish National Fund.